Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon, and today we have another excellent guest. He's the host of the Jolly Heretic YouTube channel, which is a very popular channel, author of a huge number of books, including At Our Wits End. It is, of course, Professor Edward Dutton. Thanks so much for doing the show, Ed. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Thank you for having me on. It's good to see you again. Yes, we met at the art conference. Very interesting. We were just chatting about how you met Jordan Peterson and were mesmerized by him. Indeed, indeed, I, d- I did. I met him at the some young persons do or something or other, and we 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 queued up to be to be blessed by the holy man, and it took a it it took about half an hour, and then and then I I I got there, and at first there was someone photographing me on my camera on my phone the whole time, and they used to, you see me change from talking to him about my research, he seems quite interested. He's like, oh yeah, that's very, and and then to him turning to me uh, with, with with mesmeric eyes and 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 just hypnotizing me, and you see the look on my face like. <laughs> As he's like, oh, well, you bloody, you bloody need to work hard, and and and, 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 and I'm, I'm just under. And I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it was a combination of psychological a skill as a psychologist, madness, the two things together. <laughs> but it was it was Rasputin like. It was like those photos of Rasputin you see. This 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 stare that just took me completely under. Uh, so uh, yeah. and then suddenly I had this weird desire to go and buy all his books. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, buy all my books, even maps of meaning. Even yeah, though it's really meaning, long and boring, my, bloody, bloody my maps of meaning, bloody by it now. It was, it was, it was so strange, and I, and I was kind of prepared. I was, in a way, prepared for it. I'd heard about it, and now I wonder if you know the Kathy Newman interview on Channel Four, where she basically made a, made a, made a twit of herself and all this stuff. So you're saying we should be lobsters, and um, she got a, got a, a ter- terribly bad press and looked stupid. But I wonder if part of that was that she was hip- he had. He had given her the stare. Yeah, yeah. And and she was she was thrown off because surely she can't be that illogical. She's got a chemistry degree. I mean, she can't be that illogical. Right. Make so, a fool of yourself on Channel Four. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I think he's probably something to do the power. shadow side. It's hmm? probably something to do the Jungian shadow. He's integrated his Jungian shadow. I bet it's that. It must be Almost. something to do with that, yeah. He he cast he cast a he cast a, a dark shadow over me, and then afterwards, uh, when I was leaving that do, my coat went missing. So really? There, there was some yeah, there was some kind of weird. Peter's and Nick took coat. Someone, some woman had a very similar coat to, to mine, a similar coloured coat, and she took my coat, and I was left with hers. I've heard that's um, what he uh, does. He mesmerises yeah. people, then someone nicks the coats. Yeah, and then that's how he makes a lot of his money. He's a huge collection of, of coats. The, 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 Rule the eleven: steal their bloody coats. Ah. <laughs> okay, I didn't mean to start like that, but it, we, it's just always fun to talk about the great man. Um, I was going to. Oh, we've got a bit of interference there. Is, is someone got an old. Sounds like someone's got an old Nokia phone near the, near the thing, or an old dial-up modem. I think I have an, uh, quite an old speaker. Okay, we'll I'll press on. There's always something, and you're in Keep Finland, the, Finland of course. It so it's, it's a miracle that we're even doing this. A bloody miracle. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is you, your big claim, one of your big claims is that intelligence is going down, right? It's around 100 average in the UK. You, you're predicting 80 by the end of the century. And you're saying this is basically going to mean societal collapse. And as I understand it, some people thought it was going up at one point because we were in kind of science-based culture. And so by certain measurements, it went up a bit. But that was a sort of misnomer. And actually, you say it's going down overall. And you say we're selecting for the wrong things and so we're kind of becoming thicker is that right well i don't know if you can say we're selecting for the wrong things but we're there's a, there's basically a fit it's a that's a moral issue that's different from the science that's the fact but it's a there's basically a fitness factor and uh, we were selecting under harsh darwinian conditions which were under 1800 50 percent child mortality um and we were selecting every generation for uh, fitness and what that for, for certain things. What we were selecting for was that you're physically fit, you have good uh, physical fitness, so you have a, a good immune system and you 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 easily fight off disease. Uh, for mental fitness, you know, not being mentally ill or whatever, and also for intelligence because there's evidence that intelligence is highly genetic and that in under a harsh Darwinian conditions, intelligent people were more likely to accrue resources, get rich, their offspring are more likely to survive, whatever. So the thing the the things bundle together and you get a fitness factor, and we were selecting for that until strongly until about 1800 and then you get the change industrial revolution uh, the you know the, the inoculations better housing cheaper food all this kind of stuff and so we start and so we, we are no longer as strongly selecting 
for that fitness factor. So you get more and more people who would have died as children, you know, in, in 1800, passing on their genes and whatever. And so gradually we just get, we get the things are genetically correlated, poor genetic, poor mental health, poor physical health, low intelligence, they're genetically correlated. And um, uh, on numerous measures, intelligence is, um, is in decline. Yeah. And what you mentioned earlier that, that, that we thought it was going up, that's called the Flynn effect. And that was just that IQ tests are not a perfect measure of intelligence. And uh, they also measure other things, specialized abilities that are that are weakly related to intelligence. Intelligence is a bit like a pyramid. At the peak of the pyramid, you've got general intelligence, then you've got the three verbal, mathematical, and spatial. And then at the, peak, at the, at the base, you've got these specialized abilities like doing up your shoelaces or catching a ball or, or doing a Jordan Peterson impression accurately. Literally, pitch is associated with intelligence. It is. So pitch discrimination. Um, so that, that kind of thing. And uh, what was happening was that one of these specialized abilities, uh, uh, the ability to distinguish between different properties, basically, was being pushed up to such an extent by us living in a more scientific society, thinking in a more scientific way, that it overwhelmed everything else that was happening pushed it to its phenotypic maximum and came across all the IQ tests as a rise. And then once that peak was reached, then you started to get a, a decline even on the IQ test. And, um, and and it was on the most environmental components of the IQ test, you see, that the rise was. And then the fall was on the, the genetic components. So, yeah, we're, we're becoming genetically less intelligent. And I think you can see evidence of that all the time. I mean, just all the time. If you, if you, if you look at just popular TV programs and how dumbed down they are, even, even since the, the 70s or 80s, um, as as a portion of the population becomes less and less intelligent, and you get the kind of nonsense that we have on uh, "I'm a celebrity, get me out of here" or whatever, just total lack of logic. I mean, I think it's just evident that we're getting less and less bright. Yeah, yeah. And you watch a, an old interview from a, a 1970s talk show, and it's always in, incredibly high level compared to now. Those kind of yeah, those kind of things. And um, it's interesting. Yeah, my, I got I got a one three seven on a Mensa test, but I've I've realised listening to your stuff that it can't be right because you said above one thirty is like outlier physicist freaks, and I'm like, how can I have a one three seven? So I'm thinking that was a that was flawed, but I'm I'm sticking to it anyway. And I can catch a ball, tie my shoelaces, and do a Jordan Peterson impression. Well, yeah, but yeah. One three seven seems a tad high. Well, I mean, it, I don't know. I don't know how how uh, complicated was the test. Normally, if you do a test like that, you should take it and then take it again some days later, and you should take the average. So, um, there's, no, I'm sticking there's all to my one three seven. Sorry. I'm sticking to my one three seven. I know one three seven. I mean, one three seven is the is the sort of inte- yeah, it's, it's a high. It's a reason. It's a highly intelligent person. It's the sort of intelligence of a, a science professor or something like that would, would be about yeah. that on average. So yeah, I, I don't know that there wouldn't be that, but. Um, um, yeah, it, it's that's perfectly it's perfectly conceivable. But that's that's yeah, that's high. That's top sort of two point five percent of the population. Yeah, it must have been too high. I'm, mine's totally weighted towards verbal as well and, and word based stuff. So the words always seem insultingly easy to me. I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's like, it's like and, but then the shapes and the and the and the numbers. I'm like, all right, chill out, guys. So I'm I'm much more weighted because you can be weighted towards one side, can't you? As yeah, I yeah, I, I'm the same. I'm much. I'm highly verbally tilted. And yeah, um, you yeah. and you meet meet these people that are uh, professors of physics or whatever, and and they're they're really not very good at writing. They're they're, they're, they're very intelligent and they come up with brilliant ideas and stuff, but then you know they're, they're not that good at presenting the ideas. Right. But similarly, you're going to get people who are who are quite verbally skilled, really quite verbally skilled beyond their intelligence, if you like. So they'll they'll come across because they're verbally they're verbally skilled and they know lots of big words. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll 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 come across as much more intelligent than they are. Uh, really, uh, in, in terms of if, if intelligence is solving problems, the ability to solve problems, then they won't be that good at solving problems, but they'll just be good at coming across as clever, you know, coming across as, as yeah. a, a, a poser, as highly intelligent. I think that's the one I'm doing. Um, so let's, uh, let me ask this other question. So when we have this sort of collapse, you're predicting we'll end up in a kind of what you've called a neo-Byzantium which is sort of, as I understand it, it's kind of society collapses, but then you have sort of pockets of, of uh, where society <clears throat> survives. But what, what will that look like? Will it be a kind of physical space? Will it be online? What do you mean by that? Um, well, it could be a combination of both, assuming that we don't get so stupid that we can't sustain the internet, which, which could happen. And then, then there, is, there is no online. But if you think about what happened with Rome, there's quite good evidence. We, we did a study on this recently that Rome rose and fell due to changes in intelligence. 
So you have these at the beginning of, of the Roman civilization, they're under harsh conditions, they're selecting for intelligence, they're getting clever that the, the intelligent are more likely to survive because intelligence predicts wealth and crewing resources and you know winning the battle, basically. Um, and so they get more intelligent. You, you then get the rise of Rome, you then get well, they didn't get an industrial revolution, but you get you, know, you get standards of living get really high. You get the loads of grain and whatever and uh, the, the the dole and and central heating and, and stuff like this and the selection pressure is then weakened um and something seems to happen as well uh, when when that happens when mortality salience goes down um intelligent people seem to stop wanting children to stop wanting them and that was commented on in Rome again and again and again that that, that uh, the sort of the, the upper class of Rome were not having children, and they even passed a law to punish under Augustine to punish upper class men for not having children with a, a special tax, and they paid the tax. And you see this happening now. There's something a dysphoria that's called where our evolutionary match is to be a, uh, surrounded by death, basically. And if we're not surrounded by death, then our instincts don't hit in. And if you're more environmentally sensitive, which intelligent people seem to be, they're more sensitive, that allows them, less instinctive, that allows them to solve problems and whatever, um, then, then the, the instincts don't hit in and they stop having children and they do weird things. Um, and then the IQ goes down. But, it, but Rome didn't completely collapse, not completely. Um, what happened was that you, you got among, you know, during the collapse, you got people that were um, quite religious and quite intelligent, and they seemed to band together uh, and, and into, into Byzantium, basically, where, where civilization sort of held out, uh, kind of, you know, so it was increasing dark age chaos, but there was this Byzantium where it held out. And similarly, what we found in a book I did called The Past is a Future Country uh, is that if you look at just the more intelligent people, the top IQ quartile, then among the more intelligent, the big predictor of sterility is that you're liberal and that you're irreligious, you're atheist. And the big predictor of fertility is that you're conservative and you're religious among the more intelligent. And the more intelligent are those that tend to build things and lead things and whatever. And so what you would expect would be a, mo a movement um, where, whereby there would be a, a breaking up, like a coming apart, a genetic coming apart, essentially, but because a uh, political viewpoint is highly genetic and intelligence is highly genetic. And so there would be this, this breakup, almost like speciation, where people, and I think you see this, and I think you saw the beginnings of it at ARC, where all the, everybody under 25 or under 30 who's conservative and who's intelligent in London seems to know everybody else like that. And they're, and, and, and they're, and they're dating each other and they're having children together and things like that. And, and that's sort of continuing uh, the, situ the, the situation um, through, through, through assortative mating. Uh, and the whole the whole woke thing is is forcing people a, a polarization whereby you know you, you as a conservative will breed with other conservatives because you can't have anything to do with left wing people anymore, um, and and it's creating a sense of a sense of identity and a sense of being under attack because you're conservative and all of this brings about a sort of separate group a separate polarization just like happened last time with 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 Byzantium uh, between pagans and Christians and whatever and and I, and I think you would expect those people to start to move to places where they could be with other people like them physically. Uh, yes, online, it's already happening. I mean, it's huge online. You could argue that the internet I mean, helped it to happen. Well, when, when we were kids, you know, you, you couldn't meet people on, if you were conservative, and there weren't many people that openly were, you couldn't meet other people like yourself. How could you do that? You, well, the, you, you, you had right. to rub along with who was around. And, yes. and who was around was people that were overwhelmingly, at least when I was you know, 20 or whatever, overwhelmingly supporters of the Labour Party and whatever. And you just rubbed it on with them. That's what you had to do. Now that's not happening. There's, it's decreasingly happening. There is this change whereby there is this, there is this polarisation. It's creating separate societies. And what you'd expect is for those people, as the left becomes stupider, as you get what I call the Rayner effect, the Angela Rayner effect, the stupefaction of the left. Um, and the uh, right become, become stupider, but less quickly. Um, then, then those people will will there will be a shift in society, and those people will start to take power in a context of deterioration, in in a context of balkanization, in a context of breakup, and you can see them, you know, as England breaks up and other places break up, th this this Byzantium, uh, this 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 area where all the intelligent conservatives, who the ones that are concerned about civilization basically and aren't just low IQ or or just just decadent with a death drive. Uh, where they where 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 they go, and it's something like that happened last time, and it seems to me that this could happen again. Wow! So the, yeah, the neo neo Byzantium could just be um, yeah, lots of conservatives led by Jordan Peterson in a kind of arc movement. Um, that's interesting. 
Um, yeah, and certainly what, what you said fits in my anecdotal experience of people I've had on this podcast, uh, Will Nolan being a Catholic with seven children, and we had a Mormon who had six, although I, I'm, I'm sort of bucking that trend, living like a loner, but that, it's interesting. Do you think, this is a slightly off-the-wall question, but do you think people have always always had a sense that the world is ending? I seem to recall something in, I can't remember if it's Seneca or something, I can't remember now, but there was a sense if, even in ancient literature that the world was already ending. I mean, do you think it just actually our society is collapsing now because of your findings or do you think people have always would always have a sense of sort of impending doom i think that um societies go through cycles which are which are relatively predictable and at certain points in that cycle including what when you're talking about so when they become self seneca whatever so when when they become almost like self-aware as a society then you start to get this sense of gloom and doom and that the world's ending that that, uh, that that hits in. Um, so a society can almost be seen to go through seasons. And when it's young, it's spring, it's, it's, uh, it's primitive, they're just about surviving, they're surrounded by death, they're under harsh Darwinian selection pressure, uh, there's 50% whatever child mortality, they're highly religious, everything is caused by God and whatever and is God's will. They're not really self-aware, they're just, they're just sort of getting on with life, really. Um, and then the society sort of de- develops a little bit and moves into what you might call the, the summer, where it starts exploring, it starts moving outside itself, it starts building empires and whatever. Um, and eventually it gets to a point of sufficient, if it, if it builds up, in my view, because it's selecting for intelligence every generation, um, then it, it gets to a point where you have either an industrial revolution or something like that. You, you, you have a or proto-industrial revolution where, where, where mortality salience is reduced. And once that happens, you, you have a class of people who are able to think, who, are, who aren't concerned all the time about death, who are able to sit back and think. And that's an evolutionary mismatch. We're not supposed to be like that. that that's a dysphoria. That's like being in a zoo. And mm-hmm. when you and we create our own zoo, our own warm period, and when you create a zoo, animals go a bit mad because they're not, that, that's not their match. They're not meant to be like that. And that's right. what that's what civilization is really. It's a kind of a kind of zoo, and then you get this sense of depression, uh, of of th- something not quite being right because it's not quite right because it's not our match. It's not what we're supposed to be in. It, it's, it's something's not quite right, um, and then there is this sense of the end of the world and um, um, and whatever. And and if um, and th- th- so that's one that's one uh, uh, period in which you get this set this uh, this sense of the end of the world. Another is just periods of dramatic within that. So it's not like a just a clear clear cycle, you know, sort of smooth. There's humps and bumps. And um, within that, you get periods of, of dramatic change and uncertainty. And people don't like that either. Uh, uh, humans, are, are, are animals, we like predictability. We like things to be predictable, even if they're predictable in a quite a bad way, i.e. half of your children will die. Um, we still like things to be predictable. And you notice that when you, you have periods where things are rather unpredictable because of, I don't know, famine or, or a, a, a plague or something like that, then again, you get these death cults and it's believed to be the end of the world. So there's these, there's these, these two kinds of periods that do it. It's, it's high civilization and it's just high unpredictability, which are things we, as an animal, we, we don't like. We're, we're, we're evolved to, we're a, a slow life history strategy animal. We're evolved to a, a situation that is harsh yet predictable. That's, that's our match. That's our norm. And um, if you take that away, then, then we start to go a bit bonkers. Right, yeah. And and is that and it's also tied yeah, and as you said, it's also tied to birth rate, because as you said, wealth is an evolutionary mismatch. So when we get to a certain level of economic development, we see it all around the world, we just stop having children in mm. Japan and, and it's the very and so interesting. On. It's very interesting. There's studies on this that show that um uh, if you if people are exposed to mortality salience, i.e. fear of death, um, they want more children, um, and they see children as less expensive. Which mm. helps to explain why, in the wake of World War One and World War Two, you get a baby boom. You get a baby boom in the wake of war because 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 people have been exposed to death. And similarly, if you prime people, it's this psychological technique. I'm sure Jordan Peterson would know all about. If you if you if you you know put them under, hypnotize them with your with your amazing Jordan Peterson eyes, you know, and and then and then make them think about death. Then they want more children. They see children as less expensive. They're more inclined to want to name children after themselves, so to obtain a kind of symbolic immortality, if mm. you like. Um, so that shows you that our 
our instincts, our normal instincts, are induced in a in a situation where we are surrounded by death. And of course, that and even even they when our our grandparents or whatever, or certainly great grandparents were children, a lot of them would have lost a sibling as kids. And would have been aware of that. Like my grandmother had some vague memory of a brother called Richard, very vague memory. She just vague memory. And and it turned out she did. She had this baby brother that died. Uh, she didn't even know that consciously, but she had this vague memory of it. Um, mm. And these kinds of things affect you, you know, and, and you're aware of. And now that's just gone. That's just gone. And so we we we, we can't even bear to look at images of death. We, we say on TV, oh, well, this, this contains images that you may find distressing. And if there's a dead body, then it's pixelated. We can't even look at it. Yeah, yeah. So a certain level of wealth seems to create the, an illusion of immortality that prevents us from the uh, necessary urgency to have children or the, or the need for legacy. It's almost like we're just, it keep, keeps us in a kind of bubble where we almost think, we logically know we're going to die, but we don't viscerally feel it. And, and that's interesting. Well, that's yeah. just my, my theory based on what you just said, but um, I might be changing it slightly. But well, it's, um, it's instincts not hitting in. It's it's yes. that we we have we animals have these instincts, and the instincts hit in if they're in the environment which they're evolved to be in. Right. And so, if you take them to a different environment, then it's more likely that the instincts won't hit in, particularly if they're highly environmentally sensitive. And we, as a species, are highly environmentally sensitive. Right. Fascinating stuff. Is what about this then? little theory of mine here is the problem back on the iq things not just stupidity but the ability now for stupid ideas to spread very rapidly via twitter i.e the woke mind virus that elon musk speaks of so it must said recently that um sam look at san francisco look at what a, how disgusting it's become and endless homeless people and crime and just the degradation and he said and now imagine taking that ideology and exporting it to the world via twitter and that's what we have now and that was an interesting way of putting it but it made me think are stupid ideas now spreading much more rapidly? And on, on the flip side, is the tech actually causing stupidity? For example, let's say people make a mistake online and then everyone suddenly replicates it. I've noticed people saying bias a lot when they mean bias, or that might have started in speaking because they sound similar. But whatever example, you see a stupid idea online and then everyone replicates it very quickly and it can spread much more quickly. Is that a factor? Um, in what? In, in, in what? Factor in what? In, in the sort of general decline of intelligence. Yeah, I think I think so. I think well, the, the way I would see it more broadly is that uh, even even though we had this this this, we were until quite recently a highly group oriented society, and that's adaptive. The group that's group oriented is more likely to survive. So what you have to do is you have to get the members of the group, and you have to you have to put them on the adaptive roadmap of life. And so you promote things like having children as a good in itself, and you promote things like religion and the religion saying that we are God's blessed people and we have to fight and lay down our lives for the society and, and, and so on. Now, at some point, uh, probably in the 60s, I think we had we had a build up of these of these people that because we were adapted to be people, we were evolved to that. And so the collapse of Darwinian selection will have meant more and more people that are basically selfish, that are individually oriented, that are out for themselves, that are narcissists, basically. And I suspect that a tipping point was reached probably in the 60s when they were about 20 percent of the society. And then we flipped over very quickly to being not concerned with the good of the group, but being concerned with the good of the individual, to being individually oriented, to being concerned with harm avoidance and equality. And then once that happened, you have runaway harm avoidance and runaway runaway equality, and and those things trump everything else. They trump uh, they, as, as it becomes too extreme. They trump logic and they trump reason. So I suspect there was a, there was a period there was a period you know let's say in Victorian England where you had the other other way around runaway group orientation, um, and that and that um, uh, suppressed logic and reason as well, and then that begins to decline. And then the, the new the new do it way of doing things, the proto woke way of doing things begins to rise. And there was probably a period between the two where, where one was one was falling and one was rising, and you could be optimally intelligent. You know, you weren't dominated completely by one set of religious values dominating everything you do, or another set of religious values dominating everything you do. And that would have been a period of, of very high creativity and uh, and and you know, I think frankly, really good comedy um in the in, in the seventies and eighties. Where 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 you can you 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 can you can critique the old system and whatever, but that there isn't a new set of things that are suppressing you and suppressing what you can say and what you can do, and so you have this period of optimum freedom and probably optimum logical and reasonable thinking in many ways, where where it's not it's not suppressed by other 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 factors like like religious considerations. So I think that's that's one thing. 
As for the rise of social media, yeah, um, uh, sure. If you think about like what happens to the universities, if you have a, a system where 10% of the population go to university, the people at the university are going to be highly intelligent and they're going to be focused around reason and logic and hopefully and, and, and that sort of thing. If you expand it to 50%, you change the nature of, you change the culture of the university itself. And the, the culture of the university will inevitably alter to, because there's now these people there that are less logical and less reasonable. And, and it will change the culture of the university in a, le in a less logical and less reasonable direction. Um, and that's exactly what's happened. And, and now a, a lot of what's going on at universities is about emotion and whatever, and reason can sod off, basically. Reason is an evil, evil thing, right? Now, I think it's, it's, it's exactly the same with, with something like with, with, with the media. If you go back where the people that were able to publish things in a society and get them read, I mean, it tells terribly stuck up, but we're, we're basically an elite. That were that were reasonably intelligent, and those people those people controlled what ideas were put out there, and 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 so the the, deg the degree of discourse didn't fall below a certain IQ level because those ideas well they might be discussed down the pub, they might they might they might be discussed when you've had a few and when are pissed and whatever, but they're not going to be they're not going to be publicly discussed. No, that, that that level of emotionality in particular that, that that level of emotion as opposed to reason is just not going to be out there in the in the in the in the societal discourse you bring in social media where everybody can publish everything and and then you have incentives that people are more likely to click on articles which are about conflict and whatever and about 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 emotion and because people want to read about that and then you push things the whole society gets pushed in a much more uh, emotional direction and then it becomes more socially acceptable to be emotional. And, it, and then it becomes almost like a good in itself to be emotional. Like, I'm, I'm offended, I'm emotional, and that's, that's a good thing, and you must listen to it. And so you alter the whole culture to make it much, much more about emotion and much, much less about logic and reason. And this is, I mean, this is clearly what's happened. And we've actually got, there was a data set which found on Google Ngram, the, the use of, of emotive words of emotive words as opposed to logical words in representative texts has skyrocketed since the year 2000, i.e. I, since the rise of the internet. Um, I think, I think the, the internet is, it's almost like the industrial revolution in terms of its consequences over the last 25 years and the way that it's changed things. And it's, and it's, it's changed things in a, in, a, in a democratic direction and that's in, in, the sense, in the sense of demos, in the sense of the mob. And that's not necessarily a good thing because it means that it's much more difficult. I remember when they first started reporting in the newspapers, when was it now, 15 years ago, of what people were tweeting. They started reporting that in the press. And I thought, well, why are you doing that? And the whole, the whole nature of Twitter is that you sum something up in a simplistic way. It simplifies everything. And it, and it easily militates in favour of these gangs arguing with each other and hating each other. And then this spreads across the whole society. And so you end up with this very nasty society uh, that's, that's highly polarized and is based around emotion. Yeah, great point. That's the thing I forgot to add. The perverse incentives of Twitter, extremism, emotionalism, why Peterson's always trying to ban trolls and gets in trouble for that. But I see his point. Um, yeah, and on that tipping point, you mentioned the tipping point, which you estimate is 1963 <clears throat> towards lefties taking over, basically, as I understand it. And then you talk about how it could go the other way. I mean, you say that, so conservatives, looking at the moral foundations theory, Jonathan Haidt, conservatives have things like obedience, loyalty, sanctity as important. Liberals have individual values like harm avoidance and equality, which don't necessarily sound individual to the layman, but it's to do with if I'm safe, you're probably safe. One thinks of stay safe during COVID. And it's to do with equality, you said, in terms of wanting, wanting what other people have. So they're individual values. And then... But you said something interesting. You said that liberals are high in individual individual values, low in group ones, whereas conservatives are more even across all of them. And that leads mm. to an asymmetrical empathy, whereby conservatives naturally give ground to the left. Is that correct, firstly? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, I, mean, and that's, I think that's why things, as I look at it in the past as a future country, I think that's why things tend to move to the left. Um, and you, and you, will get a, you will get runaway leftism until it comes up against something that forces it back the other way. Such as a war or a plague yeah. or, or uh, something like that. But sorry. So I was going to say, where enough people on the conservative side feel that then their values are so infringed upon that or they that, start exa to. Exactly. That enough, or enough people on the conservative side realize, and I think they are beginning to realize, just how dangerous it's getting, just how bad it's getting. And then you get a reaction. 
So an example of that I, that I look at in the book would, would have been the reaction of the Thatcher government in the uh, late 70s, the reaction to, you know, you had this extreme socialist society, that it, things have got so bad, postal strikes, strikes all the time, whatever. And so finally you get, you get a reaction and then you got AIDS, and 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 that that's the the disgust the sanctity v disgust moral foundation which was set off, and so of course then that pushed us in a very right wing direction for for quite a while. That's what it came up against. There was a serious a serious genuine problem that you you can't just have runaway individualism in a context like that. But yeah, that's true. Otherwise, yeah, the the the, the two sets of foundations. One is that you're group oriented. You're out for the good of your group. Um, but you are also concerned about things like equality and harm avoidance. Of course, they matter to you. You know, of course, they matter to you. You don't like seeing babies cry or whatever. Um, but the other is people that are just fundamentally selfish. What they are about is getting to the top of the group. They are they are Machiavellian. And if they are physically weak or whatever, or fear a fair fight, and there is this correlation between leftism and neuroticism, i.e., with men, you know, mental instability, you know, low self esteem, whatever, uh, then um, the way that you get you get to the top is by is covertly, is by virtue signaling, by by coming across as saying, "Oh, I'm really good. I'm so good. I'm such a morally good person." But you're not really. You're actually quite a morally bad person in terms of how you behave and, and you know, how you treat other people, but you want to come across as good and so you virtue signal. But, but yeah, what it all means is that the, liber the, the, the liberals cannot comprehend the conservative interest in group orientation and whatever. That's meaningless to them. They don't understand it. But the conservatives can understand the liberal interest in harm avoidance and inequality. Um, and so then things will naturally, they will, they will always give ground to them. They can always be manipulated to give ground to them until giving ground to them causes such utter chaos. It's, it's so appalling that the, everything just seems so bad, so insane. that you know, And I think you know, the, the idea that as we get something so ridiculous that we you know, we have to we have to stand up and say that person who is a, who is a, a man is a woman, and if we don't, it's not good enough to just not criticise the idea, just to shut up. That like you, it's it's compelled speech, as Jordan Peterson said. Like you must say that you must say he or she about a person that you don't think is he or she. Um, um, and this starts to then, I think if this is the thing that's setting people off. And I think maybe the other, th the other thing that certainly when we were at ARC that people found it crazy was the idea that you're going to get people that are going to happily support Hamas when you, when you, when you consider what they're doing. And, um, and this seems to have caused a reaction in the Netherlands, in the Dutch election, where you, you, you had this anti-Islamist, uh, Geert Wilders. Uh, who who went from being likely to come third to, to coming coming first, partly because people just think this is absolutely crazy. It's just, it's just gone too far. Um, so so yeah, the, the, it, it carries on until you get some kind of counter reaction, but that can take a long time. I mean, yeah. in the eighties, the the runaway individualism that could have happened was limited, I think, by um, well the AIDS and um, also by the Cold War. That there, you know, there was a clear and present danger. And that means that you you can't become too ridiculous. You can't you can't you can't become too crazy, or else you'll just be invaded and destroyed. Um, and so I don't know if there'll be something new like that, some sort of new war that will it will come up against. But it, it's certainly looking a little bit like there's some kind of reaction going on. Yeah, some people initially speculated the pandemic would 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 do that, but it didn't. It just it just it just made the culture war even more extreme. But um. Yeah, I, I think of some examples there, like Nicholas Sturgeon, when you, a sort of microcosm of what you're talking about, a male rapist in a female prison, and then everyone's like, right, that's our line, we've had enough. Though it may have been her financial dealings, and that sort of makes the example less clean, but you suddenly saw how quickly things could change. But there's loads of things I wanted to pick up there, and I wanted to get onto Holland later as well. But I wanted to quickly ask, though, you've also talked about, though, how this can go back the other way and become, as we're talking about, it can tip towards becoming conservative again. But you warned that this, I think you warned that this might not be that pleasant either. It could be a quite a puritanical Taliban-esque conservatism we could go into. Well, yeah, um, the, the idea that, that you know, let, let, let's not let's not fetishize conservatism as some unalloyed, brilliant thing. Uh, you know, let's not fetishize the 1950s as some wonderful place to live. It wasn't. I mean, I think most of us would think that the idea that a woman who has an illegitimate, who gets has sex and ha, and and there's no abortion in those days and she has a child illegitimately and the idea that that child that it was considered the, the absolutely right thing to do that that child should be taken away from her and adopted by strangers 
I mean, some people, I would say that that's probably not a very good idea. Um, and you, you, I mean, just, just from the research perspective, you should be brought up by people that are related to you and you'll get on better with those people and you'll bond more with those people and you'll be closer to them and you'll probably be sort of happy. And I'm not talking about women that are drug addicts or whatever, like that, that, whose kids are put up for adoption now. I mean, these, these were just often middle class girls that were a bit naughty. Um, but it was it was so shameful and so awful that to, to have done that, that, that so many of them, and I, I know so many of them that I got a couple of friends who's dads were adopted in this in this way um uh, now that's not you know that's you think of god no that's that's not good is it you know and 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 there are there are, there are many many things about a, about a highly conservative puritanical society i mean as i said i think we did we discuss them we met if you think about um i don't know a group there was a group that i did my undergraduate i did research on many many years ago called the christian union and if, um, if you went to university in the UK, you may have met a group called the Christian Union. Now, they, they come across, they're, they're very nice people, in my experience, very kind, very pleasant um, sort of people. But there are definite borders of behavior where if you if you if you cross the line, then you, you homosexuality, for example, is totally and utterly unacceptable, completely unacceptable. Um, and and if, if you are gay, then what these people will say to you is, well, you that's the devil tempting you, basically. And you 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 find a way to suppress that because that's not except that's not on, um, uh, and other lots of other things like that, you know, mm. uh, beating children and things as well, um, and and uh, all kinds of stuff like that that w- that w- you would say is oh dear no it's it's a bit much isn't it so I, I think that's what you will fi- the uh, you will find if it swings the other way it swings the other way in the ways that are good about a conservative society, but also in the ways that are perhaps not so good about it. And so you end up with a situation where you know different things are suppressed. So, for example, I I do you know research with people, um, uh, academic journals, whatever in in the UK, and there are certain things you know what they are, certain taboo things which they'll say, oh well, we 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 won't look into that. We 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 better not look into that. You know, better be careful there. But better not look into that. That might be going a bit far. But not look into that, right? Or similarly, I do research with uh, people in in the Islamic world. Now they're perfectly happy to look into those things. They've no problem there, but other issues, i.e., any critic, anything that relates to Islam, uh, no, we can't talk about that. Even if it's highly relevant to the study, mm. we can't talk about that. So you, you you just get different taboos, and I think that's, I'm afraid, what would probably happen if you had a, a swing back to conservative. You just get different taboos. I was thinking about this the other day when I was watching Re- uh, Ride with the Devil. I don't know if you've seen it, American Civil War movie. And I just thought I want to watch Ride with the Devil again, and there's a, there's a scene where Tobey Maguire is in the house and the jewel has a child from his, his friend who's been killed in the war, but then it looks like it's his child. So he can't just loiter around the house. So the dad goes out, he comes back with a, a priest and they get married. He goes, you're getting married today because I can't have you in my house. You either got to get married or you get out. Just arrange marriage immediately. I was thinking that's the kind of thing we would end up with in a more, in a more puritanical conservative culture. And I was weighing the pros and cons of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be, it would be that sort of thing, precisely. It would be, it would be all the things that we now re- look back upon and, and regard as outrageous about uh, um, life a hundred years ago. Uh, th- those kinds of things would just, would just come back. And we, we've seen that in real time. If you look at countries like Afghanistan or Iran, they went at least the, the sort of upper middle class in those countries in the seventies. Were were highly westernized, and they had a lot. They had a lot of the freedoms which which we had in the West at the time. And then there was a conservative backlash in those countries. And look at the difference now in Iran. You know that w- women have to wear he- a headscarf and uh, by law, and and, and 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 there's all kinds of restrictions. So it's that kind of difference uh, that you would talk about. This, this, this idea, I think that historically, basically, as I said earlier, with regard to, to, to comedy, that there's periods of freedom. There's period. There's periods of freedom where one set of of of, of dogmas, normally the conservative one, is or the liberal one, whichever, is on is on the wane, and another set of dogmas hasn't hasn't hit in really severely yet. And so you can and 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 so there's periods of of, of sort of flourishing creativity. Um, we may have seen this in the past when we when we think about something like the change from Cromwellian England to to then the the, the Restoration and George in England to then the Victorian era. And there was a period, you've got highly puritanical Cromwell, highly puritanical Victorian, and a period between the two. 
where, where perhaps there's an optimum balance maybe somehow and there's a lot of innovation and creativity and interesting plays and interesting stuff and, 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 and whatever. And then similarly, and then and then you have this very puritanical society of, of Victorian England, and then that eventually starts to wane. Uh, really, I don't know, forties, fifties, thirties, maybe something like that. Um, you know, not in, in the twentieth century, um, and and uh, and then we have a, a, a new reassertion of dogmas with the new extreme liberal, uh, extreme left wing system, which is a new kind of puritanism. And the thing I think that's difficult for people like me and you, I guess, we're a similar sort of generation. Um, is I think we were we were brought up in a period where it was very free, where it, there, until basically Blair, um, the you know, English society was it was quite free, and there was freedom of speech. And you and you you'd uh, you go someone sitting on a park bench and you'd say, "Can I sit there?" You know, free country, you know, and no one no one would say that now because that's obviously bollocks. <laughs> and and. Um, and yeah. and so and so there's this there are these optimum periods I think of freedom and what's very difficult is is uh, is getting your head around the fact that you've been under that freedom, and now you're not now now it's much less free, uh, and much less creative as a consequence, because yeah. you can't I mean how can you have just think about comedy sitcoms, how do they work you you have to suspend disbelief, that means that the the ludicrous stuff the farcical stuff, can be accepted if everything else is basically quite realistic. But if you're aware that you're being got at, if you're aware, that, oh, as you are, if you're aware that there's this sort of subtle propaganda all the time, you know, I'm not saying you don't get uh, you know, wise black judges. I'm sure you do. But, but, oh, but there happens to be one there in that scene, you know, just, just to sort of make the point. Um, I'm not saying you don't get women... Ba- uh, I don't know women barristers. Of course you do, but there just happens to be one there, you know, just to make the point. And so, and so, and it, it makes it more difficult to suspend disbelief, and it makes it it makes it more difficult for the, the art to to work really. Um, in much the same way that if you go back to the forties or whatever, um, oh well, so suddenly we have working class people, and they all speak in posh accents, and and nobody swears, and 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 whatever. It, it's it's propaganda, it, and that's what we've moved we've moved back to that. I think we've moved back to a everything is everything is flavoured with the with the sort of uh, religious uh, religion and the dogmas and the ideology of society. And there was this period, this wonderful period, I think. Where that was just less obviously so, where where comedy reflected back at you what your life was like, but but in a in a in a in a funny way. Yeah, there was a number of shared assumptions that we don't have anymore because we have polarization. So there were shared assumptions, and then they mm. could be gently subverted in a playful way in comedy and also in music. You had something like grunge in the nineties. It's like oh, we're rebelling, but really it wasn't. It was a kind of not that serious rebellion. It was, it was maybe an individualistic kind of rebellion but it didn't really it probably came from a point of economic security and shared assumptions where it was like now we're going to dress badly just for but it was kind of fun and wasn't that serious whereas now it's so polarized we it's yeah and, and it's very jarring as you said for those of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s realizing that was a much more free time the assumption things are just going to get better no it turns out they're going to go wrong and actually get much much worse that is very hard to accept and grow up with but we have in this... the 80s and 90s we were we we had the, the people that were running the society had seriously suffered like for, for, first of all they'd been brought up under a situation where it wasn't that free where you you had sort of the fag end of victorian england and whatever and all of that all that kind of stuff so that they they and secondly they've been through wars and, and things like that, and have been confronted with very, very serious hardship and death. Um, and so they they weren't they weren't decadent. They weren't going to mess around with the importance of emotion and sentimentality and whatever. They were relatively unsentimental people. And even those like John, like people born in the forties, I, I think it's that shift towards the boomers, the post-war people, um, who who had really luxury, really compared to what went before. Um, very low child mortality, in particular. Um, and and that's that's the shift of these people that, that never never suffered, never have to never have to fight for anything, and suddenly then the the, the concerns become about emotions and feelings and and, and all, of, all of all because everything else is solved and doesn't have to be fought for. Um, yeah. And then I think you make a very good point as well about the about the assumptions. Yeah. So if you have a polarized society, then the I mean these people that are woke, they may well love this kind of nonsense comedy that we're we're, we're confronted with. Uh, the, you know Nish Kumar and the, 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 these kinds of people, but there's a, there's a significant proportion of society that that don't. 
it, 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 it can't unite us in the same way that only fools and horses could or whatever, where there was just these shared assumptions. And so you end up with the, the, um, the balkanization of, of comedy. And not just comedy, you see it in poetry, you see it in every aspect of every aspect of the arts. There's, there's a, a yeah. dominant left wing sort of narrative, and and then you have the, the, these minor deviations from that. Yeah, and on a broader historical scale, there's a sort of illusion that we're going to constantly progress in a linear fashion towards ever more progressivism, whether that's good or bad, and probably we think it's bad. But there's a sort of general feeling that well, things are going to get either better or more enlightened, perhaps more progressive. But of course, it's not like that. As you say, it's more cyclical. You have people like Steve Bannon who are obsessed with this book, The Fourth Turning, that posits four different periods. And there's all these different, it gives them all these different names. I don't know that much about it. But but it's just, even that idea alone is, is quite different. You can sort of casually as a layman think, oh, we're going to go linearly, linear, linearly, but we're actually not. And we, we're learning that now in a fairly harsh way if we're from the 80s and 90s that things are, have gone clearly wrong. Well, yeah, I look at that book in the past as a future country, The Fourth Turning. And there's a, there's a very interesting Finnish researcher, well, he's sort of an amateur scientist called Jani Mirtinen, who's got a really interesting theory on how that works, which is that um, uh, animals uh, across generations go through hormonal cycles. So each generation will be slightly higher or lower in certain hormones than the previous generation for a set number of generations. Uh, let's say four, and this and this allows them to more easily avoid predation and to and 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 things like this. He noticed it in reindeer. So the height, the size of them will change predictably across a number of generations. Behavior patterns will change predictably, and that's to do with these cycles of hormones. And his argument was that fourth turning is what that is is basically, and that's what you're seeing. That basically mm. across across eighty years, the, na- the or a hundred years. The, uh, how many generations? The nature of human, the nature of the group changes with, with the presence or absence or increase or decrease of certain hormones like oxytocin or testosterone. Um, and uh, the, the result is that every 80 years you get a group in power that are very aggressive and then you get a war and you get an economic collapse. And this seems to happen quite predictably every 80, 80 years. And we're due one. Like it's time. It's time for our war and it's time for our massive economic collapse. This is the new 30s. Um, and so that's perhaps what we're just living through. And so then there will probably be a period 30 years from now, perhaps, where we might be more optimistic. But the problem is that there's there's a more general cycle, I think, of the rise and fall of civilization that's also happening. Um, right. a, a broader, longer historical cycle, which which then makes that more complicated. Right. It's all, all a bit bleak. But um, I did want to, very interesting though, I did want to switch to just, because I've got to ask you this, about this thing that, of, of traits that make people woke. So I had a few questions here. So you've said that being high in conscientiousness and agreeableness will make you socially conformist. And then, then if you add intelligence, you're more likely to go with the current thing, which is not a plug for my podcast. It's just a phrase you've used. And um, so, and okay, that's interesting. Although I'm high in conscientiousness and quite high in agreeableness, so I go, that's, that's strange. And I know that's anecdotal and that's just me. But then you also say, but if you add traditional religiosity, you might oppose the, the current thing because, and all those traits can also be associated with religiosity. But then if you add narcissism and Machiavellianism, you might be woke and that might change it. But then if you add psychopathology, you're high in, but you're a psycho, you might be more likely to be alt-right because they like risk-taking. So I'm trying to sort of figure out all this and why I'm not woke. And um, Well, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to sort of untangle. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I'm not quite sure you've summarised it quite correctly, but okay. uh, but basically, in, in general, um, uh, being a, a pro-social person, so being high in agreeableness, being high in conscientiousness, um, is associated with being conservative. So, so su- su- such people are selfless; they are oriented towards the good of their group. Um, being a, a, so, a, an extreme social conformist, which would make you want to be woke in a woke society or make you want to be a sort of church lady, you know, uh, uh, in, a, in a Victorian society, that's associated with neuroticism. So people that are high in social anxiety, uh, those people tend to be high. Those people tend to go through. So they tend to be socially. They tend to be high in extrinsic religiousness, i.e. strong social conformity. Um, and they also tend to go through periods of religious fervor, periods of religious fervor. Whereas people that are low in neuroticism, um, people that are mentally stable, 
um, those people tend to have a very sort of positive view of the world and whatever, and they, they tend to just be religious in a kind of normal way. Now, that may also be because of what I was saying earlier about pleiotropy, about traits which are adaptive becoming correlated together. So we will have been selected across time to be agreeable, to be conscientious and to be mentally stable. We also will have been selected to be religious because religiousness makes that takes that as adaptive and makes it into the will of God. It's associated with fertility. It's associated with mental health, it's associated with physical health, it's associated with uh, group orientation, it's associated with all kinds of positive things. So you would expect a pro-social personality for that reason alone. To, and also, you've got a little homunculus on your shoulder saying behave well, so you're less likely to be cast out by the group. So that, the, that you can see how that would then end up going together with, with being, um, being religious. Um, as for, um, so in general, basically conservative people, pro-social uh, and liberal people, anti-social traits um, and mental instability. Now, one thing you can do if you're mentally unstable is you can tell yourself you're anxious, you have low self-esteem, is you can tell yourself, oh, I'm superior to everybody else. It's a very easy thing to do. I'm superior to everybody else. So then you have a kind of vulnerable narcissism where you create a sort of false sense of self and you say, oh, I'm wonderful, I'm perfect. And then you get narcissistic supply, if you're woke, by people saying, oh, you're so woke, oh, well done, you know, and, you, and, then, you, and then you competitively signal your wokeness and then you're more woke than the last man. So you can see how quite narcissistic people will be drawn towards that. And that would potentially be mediated by, um, you know, being mentally, un low mental stability or just being uh, uh, selfish, basically. Um, and then similarly, Machiavellianism, well, that's being power hungry. So if, you, if you're fearful and uh, you see the world as a dangerous place, you'll want to take power over it, take control of it. How do you get power by being woke, maybe? So you can see how those things go together. Um, but yeah, psychopathology. Um, well, that could. I mean, that's about you're just an ugly, selfish person. You could go. You could go different ways. It could be that you're uh, highly. You're so. You're so psycho. You're high psychopathology. You're attracted to danger and being sort of far right or whatever is dangerous, and so you you like that. On the other hand, it could be that you're high in psychopathology and you're utterly selfish, and therefore you reason, oh well, I'll, I'll be, I'll be super woke and. Um, Whatever, but the the the, the data indicated that, that yeah that that that, that um, it was alt right was high in psychopathology and it was woke that was Machiavellianism and narcissism. So it's a sort of subtle subtle array uh, of of different threads that uh, make sense of the different personality types involved. But ultimately, it seems to me to be overall overall um, those that are uh, right wing are more pro social. Um, those that are left wing are less pro social. But those that are extremists. Those that are on the very, very far right, they're, they're also at sort of um, some extent antisocial. Right. So that's the data. And just in my own case, I was thinking about it and I get very low, basically zero psychopathology and Machiavellianism. I get a touch of narcissism on those tests, but only a normal level for a comedian and TV presenter. So, um, but I always, I've always had, but I do get high neuroticism, unfortunately. But I was thinking about this and going, can't one argue and advocate against one's own flaws so although i get i've got anxiety problems i don't advocate it and i advocate family and things like this and jordan peterson is, to an extent does this too he doesn't say go and go to a russian hospital and get addicted to ketamine or benzedrine or whatever it was he advocates certain things so can you also just advocate you don't necessarily go with you know your own traits and just you can actually advocate against your own traits is that a thing um well, I, I think it, it's uh, the, the the way I would uh, the way I would see it is that it, it's if if to, if to overall a person that is high in anxiety would, could could be expected to be uh, uh, left wing. That's what the data would indicate. But if that is coupled with let's say extremely high agreeableness and extremely high conscientiousness, for example, then that could be sufficient to outweigh the anxiety um, and push the person more towards being right wing. Or okay. if that was coupled with very high, very very high intelligence, like outlier high intelligence, like you apparently have, then um, then 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 that might allow them to reason that uh, I don't know a moderately conservative society was quite a good idea, and therefore not be pushed towards the left for that reason as well. So I think it's a balance of different traits. So for example, uh, a genius that seems to be outlier high intelligence combined with low conscientiousness uh, and low agreeableness and quite high neuroticism. But you could get all kinds of, of, of permutations within that. So, for example, by all accounts, Charles Darwin was a very agreeable person. He was a very kind person. Um, but he was also very low in conscientiousness, and his, his uh, office looked like a bomb had hit it. 
So, so you get these balances, I think, and that could perhaps that could perhaps uh, explain why a person also, as you say, could, could be sufficiently could, could have those traits and understand that they do, and and not be kind of not be um, not be drawn into their general consequences in terms of politics. Yeah, that's interesting. And one more idea on this I have is that um, openness hasn't been fully reckoned with in this as a trait. So. Openness generally indicates you're liberal or left, well, probably liberal. But um, but in a in a, I made everyone in the Lotus Eaters office do a psychology test, and they, they all came out as liberal on this because they were high in openness. And my basic theory there is, in a in a woke society, if you're open to other ideas, you're more likely to be conservative just because it's the opposite of what you're being told to do. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I suppose so. But then. I mean, a lot. A lot of psychologists are very critical of the concept of openness, right. and, 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 and argue that basically what it's measuring is being liberal. Okay. So, 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 so it's it's just a bad measure, and the the internal consistency of it is not high. So, with with the other things, neuroticism, whatever agreeableness, there's just quite a clear, strong correlation between the different sub facets of you know anger, uh, jealousy, anxiety, whatever. They kind of they correlate quite well. Whereas openness has all these different things, including things like having sort of like religious experiences or being hypnotizable or whatever. And they don't really relate very well. They don't really right. correlate very well. So what you could say is it's just not a very good construct. And because it's not a very good construct, you're going to end up with weird results. Right. Because I've been looking at it in terms of things like aesthetics and and art, because I'm a sort of creative arty person, so I'm looking at it. In, so I tried to write a piece on this called Confessions of a Conservative Rebel, where I was trying to un understand why, for example, my brother and, and some of my friends in my football team are kind of incredibly conservative, small C, and they've got two or three kids. They've had the same job since university and so on. Now they have extreme left beliefs because that's the de rigueur or whatever. That's just what that's just their social set. Whereas me, being, you know, read lots of postmodern literature and listened to obscure music and and English literature degree and so on. But then I end up conservative because it's it's a rebellion against that. So it's a kind of paradox of a conservative rebel, if there can be such a thing. So then I started to think, is it really about an artistic person now will naturally tend towards the counterculture, which in this case is conservative. Now, I, I was trying to see if you said anything about this. You talked about it in your building on uh, building, your video about ugly buildings, wh why people like them and why the left likes ugly buildings. And you argued it was a kind of the left, perhaps, although they might be high in openness and interested in aesthetics, it might be more of a moral beauty they're interested in, or it could be a kind of individualistic beauty where they can make good art, but they don't care about the wider beauty of sort of architecture and the society. And it's a kind of maladaptive beauty that they're... Well, it's, they're, high, they're high in their... Yeah, it's mad It's anti-art. I would, I would, I would see it as uh, where, where do we? I wrote about this a little bit actually in a book I did called "Sent Before Their Time" uh, on people born prematurely, um, and there was an artist called Helen Chadwick, who I thought was a good example. She did, she did a thing called piss flowers, where she um, urinated in some in some snow or something and made a mold and made the snow made the snow into a mold of flowers, and then it was these flowers made out of sort of frozen piss or something. Just disgusting things, um, and I think that you, 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 we should see, we should see the difference between art, which traditionally is meant to move you towards the transcendent and and uh, and, and 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 that sort of thing, and inspire you and inspire society. That's the point. That was the point of it traditionally, um, and anti-art, which is the opposite. It's to it's to break break down and 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 bring down society. Uh, and and um, I think that a lot of what is dominant in art for, uh, for a very long time has been, even in with sort of Picasso, it's, it's been the, the idea is to subvert things, to question things. It's not about beauty. It was about beauty, uh, but then it shifts over into individualizing values in, or something like that. Anyway, uh, the, these are high, in, the, the, these are low in sanctity. It's high in disgust. Um, and it becomes a, a, a left wing thing, which is about about just you know, uh, gaining attention by by ripping down all, all that's all that's been there before. Um, and so I, I would see if you are um, you're going to get in, in that kind of movement in an individually oriented society, you care strongly about equality and harm avoidance, but you don't care about the group oriented values. In fact, quite the opposite. The way that the way that you attain status is by critiquing those values. And and one of those one of those values is beauty. 
And so what we've had for a very long time is a sustained assault in, in art on traditional notions of beauty. Um, uh, you, you're, 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 not, you're not trying to convey beauty at all. You're, you're trying to attack it. Um, uh, to, to, to attack anything which is a traditional structure in, in any way. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that explains a lot of what's going on with modern art. Yeah, I always look at the contrast between Roger Scruton's documentary Why Beauty Matters versus Robert Hughes's series The Shock of the New. Scruton's arguing for inherent beauty. We have to reach these certain standards in art and it's quite technically difficult, but there is such a thing as objective beauty. And, and Hughes is talking about modern art, which going on from Duchamp's urinal onwards and how it's all basically just subversion. But by the way, my theory on that is that therefore there must be a new sort of conservative art which you know goes against the the, the woke orthodoxy because that's obviously it's not artistic to just be going along with conformity, especially stupidity and op- oppression. So that there will be a sort of conservative countercultural art, which is kind of. But maybe we're only just starting that. Yeah, um, there, I'm sure there. I'm sure there is, but it's it's the um, the 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 dominant cultural art is what is mainstream and is what is seen. And is what is what what is what is promoted, yeah. um, and it's the same art, the same with poetry, the same with uh, anything like that. With thing, the problem is with things like comedy that was were traditionally always done on television, uh, or or in in theatres. It's very difficult to find the uh, a, a sort of a space in which you can do so. There are attempts at it, aren't there? With this, I've I've seen this. Uh, uh, what's it called? Um, comedy unleashed. Yeah, comedy unleashed. Yeah, there are, there 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 are, there are attempts at it, um, but you know, it's it's a it's a minority sport. I think I, I guess you'll just see more and more like that. Just this this um, within academia as well. Now you've got all these cancelled academics like myself and loads of others that are that have uh, funding from various places that are operating outside the universities. The the universities have fallen, and so you end up with as as you had last time. You had under uh, in Victorian England when the univers- you had to be Anglican. To be to, to be in the universities, and so you had these dissenting academies that were, that were you know, some quite interesting pr- professors, out, like Joseph Priestley, who discovered oxygen, um, and and you know, all, all, just, so this 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 uh, the same process is just happening again, um, which in some ways is quite good. It's quite pleasing because it's quite predictable, and predictability is good. But in in other ways, it's just it's just terribly terribly poignant when you when you were brought up in a situation where there was a united culture and there was there was relative freedom. Yeah, absolutely. And um, before you go, though, I really want to get your take on what's happening politically in the in the world now. You've talked about Javier Millet in Argentina as having an example, of, as being a good example of Max Weber's charismatic authority. Where you say in normal times he would come across as a madman, but the, the sort of charismatic person has the ability to make a cold world feel warm again and inspire and 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 lead and make people think that things will be better in a time of profound stress. But you said you weren't optimistic that he'll actually achieve anything. But then we have Herr Wilders, that's my best attempt at at pronouncing it, in Holland. I don't know how you feel about him, but he seems more even hardcore. He, I mean, some of the things he's saying are incredibly kind of harsh on Islam, for example. And we have this reaction in Dublin following the stabbing. And we have France, Sweden and Denmark being tough on immigration. And I don't, So where do you see it all going? And where do you see Britain in this? Because we seem a bit behind. We're still going, oh, Suella Bravman said something mean. Whereas it seems like a lot of the world is going to this right-wing populism or as you say when you talked about builders it's going towards extremes of left and right but nothing in the center well yeah it's it's very it's very difficult in britain because we don't have proportional we don't have proportional representation so the the only way that the um, these kinds of voices can pressure is is from is from is from without is so for example the reason why we got the brexit referendum was because of the pressure that ukip was uh, was putting on the Conservative Party in terms of possibly losing seats to Labour by splitting the vote. So we have this much more complicated way, a much more, um, in many ways, undemocratic and unfair way. And so this this holds us back. This means that, po- that politically it's much more it's much more difficult to get anything like a, a Keith Wilders situation. I and mean, I can completely see that if we had proportional representation and people thought that and every vote counted, as in in Holland they have pure PR. It's just one list nationwide um you could see that nigel farage would get 30 percent of the vote i could see that happening um but we don't we don't we don't have that system so i think that's one of the things that means that we're we're um we're behind um a second thing may well be possibly that for various reasons i don't know we're, we're just sort of less ethnocentric than a lot of european countries and we're, we're there, there's there's less of a of an inbuilt 
uh, ethnocentrism to us, which means that then this has positive consequences in terms of things like the production of genius. It means you're more outward looking and then you can trade and then you can build up alliances and then genes come up by weird chance and you have a genius and the genius makes society better or bigger or a new weapon or whatever and expands and whatever. And you're fine as long as the level of ethnocentrism doesn't drop too low. Uh, but in our, in our case, it has. So that could be relevant because countries like, like Finland or Nor Norway are evidently higher in ethnocentrism than, than the British. So that could be... Um, that could be another reason. Um, a, a third reason could be uh, very high levels of immigration, multiculturalism, which which balkanizes the society and makes people less 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 likely to trust other people and create alliances and react against it. I don't know. There's any number of reasons why why Britain is behind in this process. But then on the other hand, it seems to be fairly obvious that the Brexit vote. Um, I, mean, I agree with the the left on that. You know, it wasn't about Brexit. What I think it was substantially just about expressing unhappiness with the. Uh, with the situation, um, uh, with, 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 yeah, with how with, with how how crap a lot of people feel life to be, so um, I don't I don't know at what point it would it would it would break. We have this political system which which is almost, almost unique in Europe, which is uh, just doesn't really allow people to, to properly express themselves um, in, in terms of their in terms of their grievances. So perhaps you would see more people going to the streets and, and rioting and, and, and that sort of thing. I mean, it's certainly it's ridiculous at the moment. You, you let in the best part of a million people a year, the country's population has increased by 10 million since the year 2000. Um, infrastructure has nowhere near kept up with that. Uh, people are paying, people can't afford to move out. People can't afford to get a house or if they can afford to get a house it will be much smaller than what their parents could have afforded um and it's a it's a terrible situation in the uk from what i can work out i'm mean, appalling i don't know what has to give um but they, they don't have that outlet though that, that, that of, of, a, of a, a, a a proportional representative democracy which all the other countries have yeah on my other podcast the weekly skeptic with toby young i was saying yeah pos uh, proportional representation is one reason we're different and less ethnocentric as you say but it could also be lack of borders you know being an island it could also be being confronted with hitler and the the what you know the nazis looming large in our minds and things like that uh, but but do you see this trend overall as good or do you see it as just more chaos and polarization when we have people like builders and we we have a sort of we have kind of what we were denied with trump versus bernie sanders because the democrats seem to rig it in favor of hillary we have the two populist so-called populist left and populist right is that where it's going to go? Just just more polarization. That that is that is what the data I well would indicate. Yeah, you're just going to get more and more polarization, um, right. more more the, the, the complete hollowing out of the middle. The, the, the thing they used to talk about in the '90s, you know, the the or late late '90s. Oh, there's no clear blue water between the conservatives and Labour, and they, they didn't they didn't there, there are no differences in what they really believe, and they're all basically advocating the same thing. And that was true in America as well with Democrats and Republicans. And and that's um, that's changed so much since. And yeah, you're you're, you're just it's, it's a it's this like you had in the 30s po polarization between between two extremes that hate each other. And if, eventually, if that carries on, then you get war, civil war, um, or you or you get some sort of secession, some sort of breakup, or you get a, a sort of de facto breakup. So just people retreating into sort of de facto little micro states. Um, which is already kind of happening in parts of England, really. I mean, you, you, you've got parallel lives live by, by, let's say, for example, the native population and some Muslim populations in parts of northern England. They're just parallel societies. They're set, de facto separate. Um, uh, or parts of even parts of Northern Ireland in the past that weren't really under the control of the government, like Free Derry, for example. So you could get things like that happening if it gets that, that bad. Okay. And one question I sometimes end on is how do we win the culture war? I don't know if you do that kind of question because sometimes you're more deterministic. You look at big trends. But do you have a thought on, assuming we're on the same side and assuming it is a war, how do we win it? Well, I, my optimism is the... the is the is based on the breeding patterns, which is that among the more intelligent, the big predictor of of uh, fertility is is conservatism, and so and so you you win it by a you know, having children, uh, by 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 being uh, not not constantly critiquing the other side and saying how terrible woke is. Of course, it is, but by having a, a, a clear a clear sense of what we want, what what is positive 
about the conservative side, a sense of eternity, um, a, a desire for freedom, a desire for creativity, uh, a, 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 a desire for order and structure and, uh, and, and, and for the preservation of our own, basically our own people. Um, well, how else can I put it? That doesn't mean that you have to say uh, have to have a sort of racist policy. But our our own our own people, meaning the core of English people, plus uh, intelligent conservative people that will tag along from all groups. And then you're going to get this this assortative mating as well, whereby people you end up with this strong group orientation, this this with strong boundaries, where we say, you know, we we are us, and the, the, the we um, and these are our interests, and this is the kind of society we want. And I do think that we're moving towards that. I mean, that's what ARC made me think, certainly. Slowly, slowly, slowly. But the, that something like ARC would have been... Un, you just wouldn't have something like that 10 years ago. We, we, there, the, the, as, as you understand that you're under attack, and every conservative, whether they are a fundamentalist Christian or an atheist, whether they, whether they are black or white, whether they are whatever, all, um, uh, all feel this sense that something is not quite right. And then the woke make that even worse by telling us that we're evil and wicked and... And, and and excluding us from their spaces and and and, and forcing us together, um, which then which then create and 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 by um, constantly making us feel dysphoria with their media that we're forced to watch and whatever, and and then it just it just makes more and more and more of a strong internal bond among conservative people. So I think that it's I don't I don't I don't I don't like to see it as a watch to be. I I just think it's a natural process that's 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 playing out. All right. Excellent answer. And a, a few people have said that on this podcast and elsewhere, this, this idea we need to start building, this seems to be a general recognition now. We need to build our own things and you know, not just keep having a go at the woke side. We know that's awful, but actually what are we going to do? What do we want, as you say, and where are we going? Yeah, quite a positive, uh, positive note. Maybe we can end on that then. And um, where can people find you, Ed? Uh, so they can find me at jollyheretic.com, which is my substack. They can find uh, the Jolly Heretic, which is our YouTube channel, as also on, on Odyssey. Uh, I've written about 20 books and they're all on these kinds of subjects we've talked about tonight or today, and they're all available on, on Amazon. Uh, and um, what else? X, um, formerly known as Twitter. Oh yeah, I'm on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, Twitter at, at, at Jolly Heretic. Yeah, on, on on Twitter. I'm on I'm on I'm on there as well. So okay. um, yeah, so come come and say hello. Yeah, definitely go to the Jolly Heretic channel if you don't know it already, which many of you will. It's an excellent channel. So many interesting videos. And uh, thanks so much for doing the show, Ed. Sure, it was good to see you again. Bye bye. All right, that was Edward Dutton. Fascinating episode. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Go to Ed's channel, the Jolly Heretic, to support him and just check out all his brilliant content. Quick note, guys, when I said I had a 137 on an IQ test, that is true, but I'm not saying that's definitely my real IQ, okay, before Ed's fans attack me. I didn't ask his IQ. His is probably in the 200s or something. So just to be clear on that, you know, I did get that test, but I'm not saying I'm necessarily a genius. But by the way, if you want to support this channel, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon, buy me a digital coffee, leave a comment. I reply to all of them, buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon or nickdixon.substack.com for my articles, musings, genius updates, nickdixon.substack.com or buymeacoffee.com slash nickdixon to support us. And we'll be back next week.